start recording. Okay, so we are in session. We are recording right now. So what we're going to do today is to talk about you know um, another family of instructions. So last time we talked about the bitwise not instruction, you know, in class, but the lab talks about the subtraction instruction. They belong to the same family where you know you send the output or the value of a register A, B, C, or D to the ALU, okay, the ALU does some you know, calculations, and then it sends the new value back to update a register. So, you know, so both the not instruction and also the subtract instruction uh, follow, you know, basically are in the same family. So when we go to the opcode table, today we'll be talking about another family of um, opcodes, and these are the ones that specifically you know, um, interface with memory. Okay, with the RAM. So let me point out which two or three that we'll be talking about in both today's lecture as well as today's lab. So the first one is going to be LDI. Okay, so this is one that we're going to be talking about. Uh, the next one is LD, which is load. And then the last one is ST, which is all the way down here, row 31. So these are the three instructions that we'll be talking about today. During the lecture, I can probably spend enough time to talk about two of them, um, but you know, because they are very similar, okay, they are related. Uh, talking about two out of the three should be sufficient, and then the lab will give you, you know, the exercise to kind of work with the other one. So that's the plan for today. Are there any questions before we proceed? Okay. <clears throat> so throughout today's lecture, I will also kind of suggest ways to review the content, you know, how to study, you know, basically how do you prepare for the next exam, which is exam two. I believe this is week 10 already. Um, I'm not going to have an exam next week, you know, it's too soon, so it's going to be the week after next, okay, that's, that would be the earliest we are going to have exam two. Plus, I need some time to recover from grading exam one. You guys think it's hard to take you know, to take the exam, but think about the person who has to grade for the entire class times two, right? You know, because there are two classes. <clears throat> All right, so we'll be talking about these three instructions. Um, we'll start with LDI, okay? And the way we are going to talk about these instructions is we typically would talk about column A. Column A is the binary code of the opcode, and it is seen from the perspective of the processor. Okay, so this particular binary bit pattern has to do with a decode cycle. In, in the decode cycle, this bit pattern will help the processor or the controller part of the processor to determine where in the ROM are we going to get the 26-bit bit pattern to control the rest of the processor in order to get the job done. So, so other than that, okay, the binary bit pattern is just a binary bit pattern. There's no particular reason why it is 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, and then XXX is specifying the register. The column B, <clears throat> in this case, is LDIXI. This is the mnemonic, okay? This is how we type the program in, in assembly language. So in this particular case, LDI is the actual instruction mnemonic, which stands for load immediate, okay? But unlike some of the other instructions, where you have X and Y, which means you know, we have two registers, this one has only X and I, okay, not Y. So the X is still representing one of the four registers, A, B, C, or D, in the register bank, but I is not representing another register. It is representing what we call an immediate value. From your perspective, because you have taken CISP 360 already, so an immediate value is basically a constant. So it has to be a value that can be determined at assembled time, okay? <coughs> So I is not a value that can be determined at runtime. It has to be determined by assemble time. So by the time we load your program into RAM, I has to be resolved. So that means constants are fine, right? You know, because constants, a constant like five is you know, resolved already right away. So five is going to be okay as an immediate. And we'll talk about some other way to specify you know, what the immediate value can be you know, down the down the line. So today we'll talk about the simple stuff, and then you know, at a later point we'll find out that oh, I can actually be an expression, except the expression has to be evaluated has to be evaluated at assemble time. 
So what makes LDI kind of more interesting has to do with um, column C. So in this case, you know, column C is telling us two things. It would appear that there are two things it's telling us, and they do not seem to relate to each other. So the first part, let me highlight the, the, the two parts here. So the first part is the first part here, okay? So the first part is basically saying <clears throat> we are using the program counter, the PC, as a pointer. Wherever it points to in RAM, okay, we grab the content in RAM that it points to, copy that to whatever it register X is, and that's what we do, and then after the entire thing, we increment the, pro the program counter by one. So that's actually what the opcode does. So it describes the mechanism of the opcode itself. Then what about the second one, right? You know, what about this portion here of the description? So this particular portion is the effect of the instruction. <clears throat> Whatever you specify as the immediate here is going to be copied to register X, you know, however you, you know, whichever four register you want to specify as your register X. So one is describing the mechanism, which is more important from our perspective. The other one is describing just the effect of you know, the instruction. <clears throat> so do we have any questions about that? The mechanism versus the effect. Okay. If there are no questions, we're going to move on. But in the explanation today, I'll be focusing on the mechanism, and then we can see the effect after we explain the mechanism. <clears throat> in column D, we see the usual you know, English description of what the instruction is really trying to do. It just says, you know, load constant value right after the opcode into a register, basically. That's what it's going to do. The LDI instruction is the only instruction that can load a specific value into one of the four registers. There are no other ways to do that, okay? So if you want a register, say register B, to start with a specific value, let's say 47, this is the only instruction that can do that. So that makes LDI a very useful instruction because if you want to initialize a register to a value other than zero, this is the only way to do it. Are we doing okay so far? Are there any questions about what I just said in this class? Nope, okay, so we're gonna proceed. <clears throat> so what we'll do today is we are going to write a simple program. I got one already written from yesterday. You know, this is from um, the Tuesday, Thursday class. So instead of just you know, using the same one as last time, well, it's actually perfectly okay to use the same one here. So what we'll do is I am going to, okay, so this is what I'll do. I am going to use the same example, but I'm going to use a new page to look at it, okay? So that's what we're going to do. So we'll, and this one's going to be slightly different, okay? Instead of using the ST instruction, I'm going to illustrate how to use the LD instruction. So this way, you know, you can contrast, you know, the differences between the LDI versus the LD instruction. And if you also watch the recording from yesterday, you can also get, you know, how the ST instruction works. So that makes, you know, I think this is a better way to do it. So we'll do it this way. Okay, so we'll do an LDI, you know, we'll start with something simple, okay? We'll just we'll start with LDI D with a specific value. Since we mentioned 47 before, we'll just do 47. And that's it, okay? This is the entire program. Um, you want to end every program with a halt instruction because without the halt instruction, it, and you do the auto click thing, um, it will just move on to the next byte in RAM and treat it as if it is an instruction, okay? And because RAM is usually initialized to 0, 0, and 0, 0 turns out to be the opcode of the no op instruction, so the program would actually keep going, okay, which is not what we want to do. So we want to put a halt instruction at the very end of the instruction that we are testing just to make sure that, you know, the program will stop after the instruction that we're interested in. All right, so this is what we want to do. So the first thing is, this is all in mnemonic. The question is, how do we turn this into the opcode that we can use to poke it or to kind of inject it into the RAM component? In other words, I want you to hand assemble this instruction here. So
So do we know how to hand assemble the instruction? I give you the mnemonic, you look up the opcode table, do you know how to figure out the bit pattern that we need to program into the RAM of the processor? So that's the question. Maybe, okay. All right, so this is one of those things you know, where you really kind of need to know, you know because you know, I think exam two, we have some elements you know, that require you to know how to hand assemble a program. So in this case, you know, we first look up, okay, what is LDI? And then we can find that you know, row 19 is about LDI. So we first you know, find a match for the mnemonic. The mnemonic corresponds to an opcode that has a certain pattern, which is 010011XX. So we're, gonna, we're just gonna go step by step here. 010011XX over here. The question is, what do you think XX should be in this case? XX is corresponding to the register that takes the spot of X. So do you remember what bit pattern represents register D? One one. one one, very good. Okay, I like that quick answer, okay? Because you know, we have looked it up you know, in the previous class you know, and it is actually up you know, at the earlier part of the spreadsheet. So it is indeed one one. So XX needs to be one one because register X is actually the you know, register D in this case. So we are doing substitution, okay? We are substituting, you know, X is a placeholder. Since we want X to be register D, we also want your know, one one as XX to specify the same register in the opcode itself, okay? So now that we know this part, that means the opcode is going to be what? It's going to be zero one one zero one one at one one. So that is in hexadecimal 6F, okay? Now we need to know the hexadecimal representation because that is the way that you program the RAM, okay? The, the RAM content editor only takes in your values in hexadecimal and that's why you know, we have to convert it into hexadecimal. But the other thing is, where, what about the constant of 47, okay? You know, I haven't seen it yet. You know, where do we represent it? So as it turns out, the 47 is going to be the following byte, okay? In other words, 6F is the opcode, but this particular opcode assumes whatever byte is after the opcode is the constant that we want to use to copy to the register. So we need to now represent the 47 in hexadecimal so that I can you know, program the RAM you know, um, in hexadecimal. So can someone tell me what is 47 in hexadecimal? This is an easy one because 48, which is the, right, the number right after that, is 3 times 16. In hexadecimal, the, um, how should I put it? So we have digit 0 and we have digit 1. Digit 1 tells us how many 16s do we have. Now, since 47 is only one shy of 48, then we go like, oh, it would have been 3, 0 if, it, if the number or the value was 48. Since it's one less than 48, what do you think is the hexadecimal representation of 47? Yes? Uh, 2F. 2F, exactly. Okay, very good. So we have, you know, basically we want to represent uh, hexadecimal 2F is, you know, 47. So I'm just going to write 47 in base 10 is hexadecimal 2F, you know, and I'll emphasize 2F is in hexadecimal using the 0x as a prefix. This is actually C syntax, okay? In C syntax, using 0x is you know, basically how you tell the compiler whatever follows is in hexadecimal. All right, so we know these two bytes already, and then the last one is the Hulk instruction. The Hulk instruction is pretty easy. Um, it is just your zero one in hexadecimal in terms of the opcode um, because it doesn't use a register, so there's, there's no tricks to it you know, to figure out what is the bit pattern. All right, so now we know the program is going to take three bytes, right? But you guys are going to go like, but tech, we are not really sure that you did this correctly, okay? How do we make sure that this really is, you know, the content of the program? It's a 6F to specify the opcode, a 2F to specify the constant that we want to copy to register D, and then followed by 01, which is the Hulk instruction. There are three bytes in this program. <clears throat> 
the quickest and easiest way is to control A, control C, copy all, and then go to the assembler. So we go to the assembler, we go to the source tab, okay, which is the only place you should copy and paste you know, something. And then in this case, I have, I have an original program that's longer than what I want to put here. So I have to erase the entire program and then go back to the first cell and then paste the actual content of this particular program. So now we have pasted the program and you can see the column B is not reporting any errors, which is good. Because if I've made a mistake, column B will tell me that, hey, you got a mistake here, okay, you got to fix it first. So without any errors, I can now go to the assemble tab. The assemble tab is particularly useful because it shows you the original code, okay, without the comment. But it also shows you that at location 00, zero we have a content of 6F, and then the next location, which is 01, has a content of 2F. Okay, so we got that part right, okay? We got the opcode, we got a constant of 47, you know, uh, specified in hexadecimal correctly here. And then, you know, the next instruction is the halt instruction, and the halt instruction is at location 02, and it has a content of 01, which is also exactly what we specified earlier. So, so this is good, okay? So that means you know, the way that we hand assembled the program is correct. Do we have any questions about what we have done up to this point? We're good so far, okay? So now what we'll do is we are going to run this code in Logisim, and I don't think I have Logisim up and running yet, so give me a second here to get it up and running. <clears throat> There we go, and then once we have Logisim up and running, we just load the processor, okay? And in this case, I'm gonna zoom out just a little bit because you know, otherwise it's a little bit harder to find the RAM component. Now for a program this simple, I'm just gonna hand code it, yep. That is a good question. I am indeed recording, and both the audio and the video are done correctly. Thank you, thank you for checking. So we have 6F as the opcode of the LDI instruction, followed by a 2F, which specifies the 47, which is the constant that we want to copy the register D, and then followed by a 01, you know, for the halt instruction. So that's one way to get the program in, okay? You know, the other way is easier, okay? Because the other way, I also want to demonstrate it, just so that people remember how to do it, because I'm pretty sure that not everybody remember how to do it. So the other way is to go to the assembler, switch to the RAM file tab, go to file, click on download, and then go all the way to CSV, because you know, we want to download the RAM content as a CSV file. And then we can call this one just LDI.CSV. It's already here, but that's okay. I'm just going to replace it. Then we switch back to the um, Logisim, and then in Logisim, I can now right-click on the RAM component and then go to load image, and then I go to the place where the file is located, which is temp slash LDI.CSV, click open, and you know, it would appear that nothing has changed because the RAM file specify exactly the same three bytes that I have already programmed into the RAM, so that it would appear that nothing, that nothing happened. All right, so now that we have done this part, okay, it's time to actually execute the program. On Monday, we talked about you know, how to track down the fetch, you know, uh, fetch phase of the execution of the instruction. Uh, we talked about how the program counter is used to go to point to a location in RAM, and then we grab that content and put it into the instruction register, and then we increment the microcode pointer to 001, and then we clock, uh, we have a rising edge of the clock, which incremented the program counter. So we did all of that on Monday. I'm not gonna do it today. So I'm gonna fast forward to the part where the instruction actually executes, okay? So, which is not to downplay the importance of you know, knowing what the fetch cycle or the fetch phase is and what is the decode phase. It's just that you know, we do not have enough time to keep repeating that process in the, in the lecture, okay? And having the, everything recorded is really helpful. 
Now, if you want to check out the Tuesday Thursday class, that works too because the two classes are fairly in sync right now. So I might have explained things slightly differently between the two classes, which means you know if you watch the other classes you're recording, you might pick up something that you did not pick up in this class. Might okay. <clears throat> I don't think it's going to be that significant, but you know, for those people who want to kind of check out the other class, you know, the recording from the other class, feel free. Okay, it's you know, it's okay to do that. All right. So when the processor first quote unquote powers up, which means you know, we just started up in Logisim, this is the initial condition. The micro cool pointer is at zero zero zero, and then the clock is at zero at this point. So I'm just going to fast forward you know, through the first. Um, Rising edge, falling edge, and then the rising edge, and then you know, with the following falling edge, we pay attention. So the first rising edge is fetching, you know, putting the 6F into the instruction register. The falling edge is going to increment the microcode pointer itself, and then the next rising edge is going to increment the program counter to 0, 1, and then this falling edge is kind of significant because it is the decode of the opcode of 6F, so that means the microcode pointer will become 6 F zero. Okay, that's what decode is all about. Is we look at the opcode and then use that to quote unquote compute you know, what address in the ROM has the bit pattern corresponding to that particular instruction. So control T one more time, and you can see how the micro code pointer is now six F zero. Now we slow down. Okay, because right now the processor is configured to execute the LDI instruction. And if this one is kind of busy, okay? LDI is kind of a busy BE because you know there are a few, there are two things that is going to update. One is obvious, one is like, hmm, not so obvious. All right, so what do we do now? Now we shift our focus to the upper portion of the processor, and then we ask the question: what is active? What is going to be updated? Okay, so that should always be the question that you ask: is what is going to be updated? Okay, so just visually, can we tell what is active? Well, just from looking at the bright green lines, we should be able to tell so that certain things are probably active. The program counter is active because the enable port of the program counter now has a one. So we have to remember to track down the program counter and figure out, okay, how is that gonna be updated? We can also see that RAM is being selected right now which means you know, it's a, there's a good chance that the RAM component is being utilized. So right off the bat, we can see that these two things are active, but we also see that RIEN, or register input enable, is also bright green, and that tells us that one of the four registers in the register bank is going to be updated, okay? So that tells me quite a few things already, okay? But we'll follow this one thing at a time, okay? My favorite is to follow RAM first, because you know, once you know that RAM is being used, you, can, you should automatically prompt yourself to ask three follow-up questions, okay? So this is one of those things you know, I really want to teach in my classes, not just this one, but also in all of my classes, is how do you train your mind to ask follow-up questions automatically? Because you know, that technique will help you take your additional classes, not only here, but at a four-year university, and also it will help you learn new material in a much more effective way than just relying on you know, someone to tell you something or reading a book. Because if your mind is seeking out automatically and asking those questions and looking for the answers, then things will sink in better, okay? It will just kind of gel in your head you know, and make connections to all of the other concepts that you have learned already in a much more efficient way. Okay, so getting back to RAM. So once we know that RAM is in use, the first question I would ask, this is not the only order to ask those questions, but the first one I would ask is, are we reading from RAM or are we writing to RAM? Are we updating the content of a byte in RAM or are we just trying to get the content of one byte in RAM and feed it to somebody else? So the answer to that question, Okay, you know, we answered that question on Monday's class already. Okay, the, the answer should be answered by, look, the answer has to do with LD. LD is a one right now, and that tells us that we are reading the content of the location in RAM. 
So I just answered one of the three questions. So now that we know that RAM is in use, we're reading from RAM, the remaining two questions are, who is determining what location to read from and who is paying attention to the content at that location? So those two are automatic questions just based on you know, what RAM does you know, and also the other ports of RAM. Okay, so we'll answer those questions one at a time. The first one, you know, in my order, you know, I always you know, try to answer the question of who is specifying the address first, okay? So the address of where we are reading from is controlled by the A port, which stands for the address port. So the address port, okay, connects to this node. It ends up here as the output of this multiplexer. The multiplexer has a select of one, and that means, that means your input one is connected to the output. So that means if I want to track my way you know, further back to the origin, I only have to track you know, input one of the multiplexer. It, comes, it connects to a few things, but the other two things, okay, out of the three things that it connects to, two are totally pointless okay, from the perspective of this analysis. Uh, this connection here to the output pin is really just you know, reflecting the value of that node. It doesn't change anything. Okay, so that's not going to be helpful in our analysis. The other one is this connection here. This is an input to the adder. It is not an output. It doesn't specify the content on this node. So that means you know, from our perspective right now, it is also not very helpful. Now this one is useful because this is the Q port is the output of the program counter register and it is specifying the content of this node. So once you put all, the, all of these things together, now we know that the program counter is connected to the A port of RAM, which means the location that we are reading from RAM is determined by the program counter. Now, just right now, <clears throat> if I switch back to the uh, opco table description here, that kind of addresses this part here. So let me just highlight the, the part that is being addressed right now. Because we know that the program counter is being used as a pointer because it, it, it's determining, determining the location in RAM. And now the question is, um, where are we going to copy the content of that location to? So that becomes the next question. We can answer that question by tracking the D port of RAM because that's the output. It, it now has the content at the location of <clears throat> uh, in RAM. So we switch back to here. So this time we have to track you know, the output of RAM you know, through the D port. This one does go to a whole bunch of places, but we can kind of rule out a bunch of these like almost right away. Uh, this connection we can just rule out because once again, it's an output pin. All it does is to reflect the content of the node. It does not do anything else, okay? So it's not really that useful. This connection here is the output of one of the D multiplexers. But the demultiplexer is turned off anyway, okay? So it's not, you know, it's not going to be helpful to our analysis. Uh, this connection here is also useless because if you look at this multiplexer, the select is a zero, so we are not even paying attention to input one of this multiplexer. It doesn't even matter where this multiplexer is connected to or where the output connects to, because we are not paying attention to the input of where the selected node is pointing to. Is that okay? So this is how we can quickly rule out you know, things that are you know, not really important at this point. There's also this connection here. It is also pointless, okay? Because the instruction register is currently disabled. So even though the content at this location of RAM is fed to the D port of this register, it doesn't matter because the register is turned off. It's not gonna update, it's not paying attention to the node that we have highlighted. So that leaves only one thing, right? It only leaves this connection here. So we look at that connection. It is input zero of a multiplexer. This multiplexer has an enable. It is enabled right now. So now we have to look at the um, select. The select is only one bit wide because we only have two inputs. The select is a dark green, which means it is a zero. So that means the multiplexer is turned on. It is connecting input zero to its output. Ah, we probably should pay attention to this one. Does that make sense? Okay, 
So now we look at the output of the multiplexer and it goes into one of the ports of the register bank. So right now, until you're very familiar with what the register bank does, the only way to figure out what's going to happen next is to look into the register bank. Okay? So we now right click on the register bank and now we look at you know the this is the in this is the label in of the register bank. So now we go like, okay, where are you connecting to? Oh, it's a multi-drop. So this is what we call a multi-drop uh, topology in networking, where you know the same node connects to multiple you know uh, devices. So it does connect to the D port of register A, register B, register C, and also register D. But only one of them is is going to update. Can you tell visually which one is going to update? <clears throat> register D, very good. So register D is the only one that has the enable port being a one, and everybody else has the enable port being a zero. So even though the content of your know, 47 or 00101111 is presented to the D port of all four registers, only register D is paying attention. The other three registers were not, they are not even listening. Okay? So, oh, okay, so how is register D paying attention and the other ones are not paying attention at all? That has to do with the decoder here, okay? So this decoder is enabled. This one is connected to the enable of the decoder, and the decoder has a select of one, one. This is output zero, output one, output two, this is output three. Three is also known as one, one in base two, so that's why we, this is the mechanism of how we specify which register is going to update. Is that okay so far? Okay. So now we have made the entire path. We know that the program counter is specifying which location in RAM to take a look at. We can find the path from the D port of RAM all the way to the D port of register D in this case. So we now know the register D is going to get whatever the program counter is pointing to in RAM. So we got that part to figure out. What about the PC++ part, okay, the auto increment of the program counter? So we have to go back to main, okay, we look at the program counter this time, and we can see that the program counter has its enable port being a 1, which means the program counter will update on the rising edge. The question is how? So now we track it down, okay? We track down the D part of the program counter because that's the input of the program counter. It's coming out of a multiplexer. This multiplexer has a select of zero. So that means input zero is being used to update the program counter. We track down the wire going into uh, input zero. It goes, whoop, just loop around here to the adder, right? And then the adder is adding basically a one, okay? to the existing value of the program counter. The existing value of the program counter is a zero one. You add one to it, it becomes zero two. So we can also poke the wire to see whether that really is the case or not. So you just poke this wire here, and it tells you that in uh, binary, it is zero, 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 one, zero, which is also in hexadecimal, a zero two. So this is how we, found, we can find out that Oh, the program counter is going to increment, and at the same time, register D will update to you know, the binary bit pattern of 47. Both of those are going to occur at the same time. Are we doing okay so far with the analysis? Now, if you say, you know, oh, I cannot track all those details because I don't know the processor as well as you do, Tech. That's, that's a very fair statement. I understand it. It's not a problem, okay? Because you know, knowing where to find which component is something that you acquire as you get more familiarized with this picture here. It's like a map. But what is important is you understand the way I reason it out, okay? So that is the most important part is to, re is to follow my reasoning of how I track down everything, okay? So now we can actually take a look, okay? We can actually look at both updates at the same time, especially since you know, this is recorded, so you can kind of replay back just this portion, because you can see how register D, you know, the output pin here, which reflects the value of register D, 
it's going to update to um, 0010 followed by 1111. And at the same time, you know, the program counter here is going to update to 02. Or you can also look at the output pin corresponding to the program counter. This will also update to 0000, 0010. So both of these will update at exactly the same time. So are we ready for the rising, rising edge? Okay, so control T. And you can see that you know, how the program counter updated to 0000, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, And then also at the same time, register D updated to 0010111. That explains why it is documented like this. Because X is our register D in this specific case, and then the program counter was a 01, it is now a 02, and the way the content that we copy to register D is the 47. Where did we get a 47? That's where the program counter was pointing to before it incremented itself. <clears throat> so are we doing okay so far with the explanation of the LDI instruction? Okay. So the LDI is one of the more quote unquote tricky instructions. You know, the only instruction that are more tricky uh, are the conditional branch instructions, which is not today's topic. Okay. All right. So are we good so far? Okay, all right. So what we'll do next, what I'm going to do next, is going to change the program a little bit, make it a little bit longer, because I also want to illustrate how to use the LD instruction. Okay, so I'm going to change the program a little bit here. We have an LD, um, um, let's say BB over here. And then we have the... Then we start to use a label, okay? Well, let's not use a label first, okay? We'll just kind of do it by hand first. So over here, we have a byte, and we want to change this byte value to um, initially to 102, okay? So these are all in uh, decimal. So 102 is in decimal. And the 47, I'm going to turn it into a question mark for now, okay? Because what I really want to do is register B would end up with the uh, representation of 102. So let me, um, so I want, you know, after this instruction, I want B to be 102, which is, you know, the content at this location here. That's the intent of the program. The question is, how do I get the program? How do I change the question mark so that by the time the LD instruction is done, register B will end up with the binary bit pattern corresponding to 102. So that's our new challenge now. So the way to solve this problem is to look at the um, effect of the instructions. So now we take a look at this program here, and then we ask, okay, so if we are not going to look at the mnemonic, and focusing on just you know, what the program is doing to the register. Currently, we have something like this. Okay, the first instruction, the LDI instruction, is going to copy some value to overwrite register D. <clears throat> and then the LD instruction, you go like, oh, but Tech, you didn't talk about the LD instruction. That's okay, it's right here. So the LD instruction is going to copy whatever register Y or the second register is pointing to, um, to copy that to register X. So in this case, you know, we know exactly which two registers we're talking about, so it becomes that. Does that make sense? Because all I did was really just to look at the mnemonic, match up with the um, opcode over here, and then instead of using referring to the placeholders X and Y, I know exactly which two registers we are using, which is register D and register D. Are we good so far? Okay. And then I just you know, put another line so comment here, and we want B to be 102. So the question is, how do we get that to happen? So everything hinges on one thing. What is the byte thing, right? You know, what is the byte thing doing over here? What is byte 102? As it turns out, all that does is to say, all that does you know, with the byte, byte is not an instruction, it's called a directive. 
because it's it is not. Let me see how to put it. It doesn't specify an instruction. It does not specify something that the processor should execute. It only specifies that. Oh, by the way, I need one location here, and I want that location to be representing 102. That's all byte is doing. It is simply saying, use one byte right here to represent the constant that I give you here, which is 102 in this case. Is that okay? All right, so what do you think this question mark should be in order for register B to get the content of 102? So let's do some you know, quick analysis here. This looks really kind of cumbersome, but all it really is doing is to say, copy this unknown value to register D, then use register D as a pointer, go to where it points to, copy whatever it points to to register B, and I want register B to end up with a value of 102. So that means if you don't want to go through all the extra steps, you can, you can basically just go like, oh, so tag, this is all you're trying to say here, okay? Which location contains the binary bit pattern of 102? That's basically what we're trying to figure out. Does that make sense? So I'm going to pause here to see if there are any questions. <clears throat> yep. Um, I'm just shortcutting here because you know, this is just a really roundabout way of specifying this. I copy a, a no value or a value to be determined to register D, then I use the value of register D, register D as a pointer. Whatever it points to in RAM is copied to register B, and I want register B to end up with a value of 102. So I know there's one byte that specifies 102 because that's the whole purpose of byte 102 is doing. Okay, byte 102 is telling the assembler and just say, hey, take up one byte and make that byte represent 102. That's what byte is trying to do. It's just telling the assembler to reserve another location and use that location to represent 102. So we know that the binary representation of 102 is going to be sitting somewhere in RAM. I need to figure out where that is. Is that okay? So I can do this by hand, okay? The whole thing can be done by hand because we have already figured out you know, the, uh, the program up to this point, okay? So this is gonna take up two bytes. The first byte is the opcode, which is the 6F. The second byte is the constant of 2F. We have not figured out this one yet, okay? You know, how many bytes it's gonna take. So what we're gonna do? We're gonna hand assemble this one too. So LDBD is matching the LDXY pattern. So we have to kind of figure out what is the 0, 1, 1, 1, and what are the uh, XX and the YY. So let's go figure that out. Okay, so 0, 1, 1, 1, XX, YY. So what do you think is the XX in this case? XX has to specify register B. What pattern? Which two bits will specify register B? 0, 1. Very good. Okay, so I can definitely tell that some people have been, you know, absorbing, you know, the content from the previous lab, you know, or having you'll know, study a little bit more after class, so that's good, okay? That is absolutely excellent. So what is YY in this case? YY has to specify register D, and that will be 1-1. One, one. Very good, excellent. So that means, you know, combining these two, you know, the opcode is going to be 0, 1, 1, 1. XX is a 0, 1. YY is a 1, 1. So it is just kind of funky that it turns out to be hexadecimal 77 seven in this case. Are we doing okay so far? Okay, all right. So then, then we have the halt instruction, which is you know, always just zero, one. And then we have this thing here specifying, oh, use one byte to specify 102. So can you guys do a quick conversion from base 10 to hexadecimal? How do you represent 102 in base 16? So once again, the question you should be asking is, how do we represent 102 as a multiple of 16 plus whatever the remainder is. The quick, the, sorry? It's a 6, 6, that is correct. Because you know, 6 times 16 is a 96, 102 minus 96 is a 6. So it is indeed 6, 6 in hexadecimal. There we go. So now we have to look at the locations in RAM, okay? 
if this is the entire program, uh, the 6F is going to take up location 0, 0. The 2F is going to take up location 0, 1. The 7, 7, which is new in this program, is going to take up location 2. The halt is going to take up location 3. And then the 6S is going to take up location 4. Okay? So that means, oh, so that means we just need this question mark to be a 4. Because location 4 contains the bit pattern for the constant of 102. Is that okay? All right. So I have just talked about all of this stuff here, you know, in theory, right? You know, and you know, I can make mistakes. So I will go ahead and copy this and put it into the assembler so that we can confirm whether I made a mistake or not. And believe me when I said, when I say, a lot of times I wish I made mistakes. You guys go like, why would a professor want to make mistakes in his class? Indeed, why? Okay, first of all, do you think it's for my benefit or do you think it's for your benefit? For your benefit, okay. So how would my mistakes in the class be beneficial to you as a student? Yep. That is correct, okay, because you know, if I make a mistake, the most important part is somebody has to catch it, okay? So if I make a mistake and no one is catching that mistake, then it's bad. It's absolutely bad in that case. But if I make a mistake and someone, can be myself, can be one of you, catches that mistake, then it's a good thing. Because now we can go back and say, what is that mistake? Why did I make that mistake? Okay, because you know, there has to be a reason that I make that mistake. Can be just a simple, honest, you know, operational error. Can also be a conceptual problem. Okay, and when we get to actual coding, making a mistake and getting the program not to work is a great thing, because then I can show you how to debug a program. When was the last time you took a class where your professor showed you how to debug a program? The process, the thought process, of debugging a program. I'm not talking about the tools. I'm not talking about how to use GDB or VS Code you know, for debugging purposes. I'm talking about the thought process of debugging a program. Were you guys were taught you know, how to debug a program from your other classes? Yeah. I think that is one of the most important things to teach at this level, is how do you debug a program, OK? So we'll get to that you know, later in this semester in this class. You know, I think we will have some opportunities to do that. All right, so now we have to go back and kind of check the program because I suspect the program should be 6F, 2F, 7, 7, 0, 1, followed by 6, 6, right? So the quickest way to check that, you can do it in the assemble tab, okay? Because the assemble tab, if you look at column W, X, Y, that should give you the same thing. So we have 6F, 0, 4, okay, I changed that to, to 0, 4, uh, 7, 7, 0, 1, and then 6, 6, okay? So they do match, okay? <clears throat> so now we run the program, okay? And this time I'm going to use the RAM file to download and then put it into the RAM component. So we go to file again. So I'm doing this because I want to remind you guys how to do this, okay? You go to download, and then you go to CSV, and then you save the file. So in this case, I'm going to save it as ld.csv because you know, this time we are illustrating what ld does. <clears throat> and then we switch to the um, logic sim. And because we are loading a new program in and we're trying to run a new program, the safest thing to do is to go to simulate and then reset the simulation. Because we need the clock to reset back to a low state and also we need to clear the RAM content here because we're going to load a new program into RAM. So now we go to RAM, we right click, we go to load image, and then we load LD, this time, dot CSV, and here's the program, okay? Now we can double check again, right? So the content of the program is 6F, which is the opcode of LDI, 04, which is the constant that we want to copy to register D, uh, 77, which is the LD PD instruction, 01, which is the halt instruction, and then the 66 is the byte 102, which is really just the assembler saying, oh, I see you want one location in RAM to store the constant of 102. Are we good so far? Okay. 
So I'm going to fast forward the execution until we get to the 7-7, seven, seven, okay? So I can do a control T, control T, boom, 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 boom. Okay, there we go. Okay, so now we have, um, <clears throat> so which phase am I in? We can just take a look at the micro code pointer. We are about to get into the fetch cycle or the fetch phase of executing an instruction. And you can see how after the fetch, the instruction register has the opcode of the instruction that we're about to execute. Then we have a falling edge. The micro code pointer increments to 001. And then the next rising edge should increment the program counter. So it auto increments, control T like that. And now we have the decode cycle, which is you know, where we need to slow down because the 77 is now going to be copied to the micro code pointer so that the micro code pointer becomes 770 and that location in ROM is going to dictate how things are going to be connected. So control T, so this is where we kind of pause the execution and then we go back up to the processor and to find out how things are connected. Are we still doing okay so far? Okay. <clears throat> so this exercise is about the same as last time, but certain things have changed. So we can see that RAM is still being addressed, okay? It is still being selected, which means we are using RAM. So we automatically ask the three other questions. Are we reading or writing? We are reading, okay? We are getting the content out of one location and somebody wants it, okay? So now the next two questions that we have to ask is, who is telling us where in RAM that we should be reading from? Okay, follow the A port. The A port goes back to this, the output of this multiplexer. But this time, the address mux is a zero, which means we track down input zero instead of input one. Is that okay? Because this part is different from the previous exercise. So now we <clears throat> use, uh, I use the poking tool to follow you know, input zero of the multiplexer. Oh, this is an easy one. It is coming straight out of a demultiplexer. So we look at this demultiplexer here. It has a select of zero, which makes sense, okay? Because now we know the output zero is connected to the input. So now we track down the input and go like, okay, so who is sending out stuff through out one? Now, because this is like the third time we look at the register bank, you probably do not remember how it works. It's okay. Right click, go to view register bank, now we have an inside view of what is inside the register bank. We're looking at register output one. So we now track this one down and it is the output of this multiplexer. So which one of the input is connected to the output of this multiplexer? Ah, look at this one here. Look at the select. The select is saying one, one. So it's selecting you know, input three to connect to the output. So now we track down that particular input right here, and you can see that it connects to register D. So this is how we can tell that register, register D is being used as a pointer to specify which location of RAM we are interested in. Is that okay? So one thing I do want to ask, okay, it just occurred to me. One thing I do want to ask is, does this actually help you understand the concept of a pointer from CISP 360, now that we're actually looking at the mechanism of what pointers do? Or does it actually make it more confusing? Okay, cool. Yeah, because I think you know, by the time we get to assembly language programming, you know, some of the concepts that you have learned in CISP 360 actually becomes more clear. It's like, oh, so now we know how it is done. So it's not mysterious anymore, okay? So we'll get to some many of the other concepts like recursion, how does a function return to where it's supposed to go back to, how parameters are done, what are local variables. We'll actually clarify, we'll see the mechanism of all of those things later on in this semester. <clears throat> okay, so that answers one question, but it doesn't answer the question of um, who is getting updated, right? Okay, yes, it does, you know, that picture actually does help, but we're gonna track it down as a separate thing. So the output of RAM is this node here. We did the analysis already, so we, we don't have to repeat the whole thing, okay? So we now just go like, okay, this is the multiplexer, it is enabled, and we are looking 
at the input zero connecting to the output here. So we, sh we should pay attention to this one. So now we go back into the instruction, I mean the register bank, and we say this is specifying the content of to up this is specifying the value to update one of the four registers. And because the register B is the only one that is selected, because register input select is a zero one. So now we know register B is going to be updated based on port D of RAM. And that is why, <clears throat> that is why, uh, right here, that is why we describe using RTL or the register transfer language. What, we, what is about to happen is described like this. <clears throat> so do we have any questions about connecting the mechanism of the processor to how the operation is described in RTL or register transfer language. Are we making connections between those things? Okay, excellent. So <clears throat> we go back to the simulator. Yep, there we go. And then we go back to main um, so that this way we can take a look at how register B is going to change. So according to what we did earlier, register B should become 66 in hexadecimal, which is 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. Okay, so that's what we're expecting to change in register B. The program counter is not going to change this time. Because you can see that the program counter is not enabled. Okay, so it's not going to change. So now here comes control T, and we can see how register B is changed from 0, changed from what it was, which was all zeros. Now it is 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, which is our 6, 6, which is also the value of 102. All right. So let me take a look at the time. We still got enough time to use. Let's take row first, and then we'll kind of come back and talk about the concept of a label. So let me release the row taking activity. It is uh, the 25th of October. And the access code is just ST all in lowercase. ST stands for store, LD stands for load. They're basically opposite of each other. So go ahead and take row first, and then we'll kind of get back to talk about the purpose of using labels. <clears throat> Does anyone need more time for row taking? We good? Okay, all right. So let's go back to the program itself, okay? So did you guys you know, notice how I figure out you know, the unknown or the value to be determined should be a four? I had to hand assemble the program. Then I had to count, right? Location zero is the opcode of the LDI instruction. Location one is the constant that is associated with the LDI instruction. Location two is the opcode of the LD instruction and so on. So that means every time I insert any code between the <laughs> LDI instruction and the byte operative, I have to redo all the counting. And it's very easy to make a mistake of miscounting because some instructions take two bytes, others only take one byte. So to rely on me doing all the counting is not really the best way to do things. Since we have the assembler that already has the capability of putting all the bytes together, don't you think it knows where things are automatically already? So it would make sense that we can use the concept of a label and just say, you know, <clears throat> label definition L1 is just going to associate a symbolic name of L1 with whatever is at that location. So this is how we can bookmark, okay, using a symbolic name to bookmark the location of whatever is right after the label definition. So label L1 with a colon is defining a label of L1. Now, L1 is not really a, ter it's not a terrific name for a label because it really doesn't say what it is for, but it's just a name, okay? 
So now, instead of having me to hand count all the locations, I can now go back in and say, Oof, okay, I don't have to hand count anymore. I can just refer to the boat mark. Because the boat mark is sticking there, I can now insert you know, a bunch of useless instructions in between, like a bunch of no-op instructions, and the assembler will still be able to figure out what L1 is supposed to be. Now, no-op instructions, as the name implies, is no operation. It doesn't do a single thing. It's just taking up space in RAM. Okay. Now, do they execute? The answer is yes, they do execute, but they have no effect whatsoever other than just incrementing the program counter. That's all they do. It's just burning your processing cycles. <clears throat> okay. So we're going to take a look at this program. Okay. With all of this stuff, you know, added, we switch back to the assembler. And then we go to the source tab. Remember, the only tab where you should insert your code is the source tab, column A. So now we look at this program. Okay, make sure that there are no errors. There we go, it's all good. And then we look at the assemble view. Okay, so these two extra zeros here, they're the no op instructions. But it does push the location of the 102 to location 06 instead of location 04. So the question is, are we still loading the correct constant into register D using the LDI instruction? What do you think? Yep, the assembler does everything for me. So that is the idea of using a label is so that I don't have to count the locations. I can rely on the assembler to say, okay, this location is really interesting to me or I need to know where that is. I'm gonna give you a symbolic name over here. And I, I'm relying on the assembler to resolve the value of the label so that I don't have to do the counting myself. Are we good so far? So how do you know the value of a particular label? Okay, because there occasionally there are times you want to know, okay, so this is label L2, but I really want to know exactly where that label is. So <clears throat> the way to do that is to use a tab that is all the way to the right-hand side in the uh, in Google Sheets, and you go to Sim tab, which stands for Symbol Table, and then you look at the only cell that has a value. Well, there are two more cells that have values, but this one is the one that we want to look at. So this is what we call a JSON representation, or JSON you know, representation, which stands for JavaScript Object Notation. Okay, you know, that is super important. It's basically a description. Okay, so what I'll do is I'm going to cut. I will copy this, and I'll show you how to decode it. Okay. Um, all you have to do is to go to JSON pretty printer. Okay, that's one way to you know, describe uh, <clears throat> a program that can that can basically show you the whole thing, but in a, in a different structure. So obviously, I have something here already, and um, once I update, you can see on the on the left hand side, it is not indented in any way. It's difficult to make any sense out of it, and then on the right hand side. It is now fully decoded, okay? So L1 is the name of the label. You know, I convert everything to just lowercase, you know, to, to store internally. It is defined on line six, okay? So line six is the location in the file where the label is defined. Now, we have a, a whole bunch of coincidences here that that's why there are so many sixes here. RPN is the actual value of the label, okay? So if you want to find out what is the value of a label, you look at the RPN field of the label definition. The address of six here is, it also means you know, it is at address six, but it is the RPN that you should pay, you should pay attention to. That tells you what, how the link, what is the value associated with a symbolic you know, label. Is that okay or not? Sort of, okay. <clears throat> Now, how many labels can you define in the program? The answer is as many as you want to. Okay, so in case somebody wants to find out, oh, where, where, where are these two no op instructions? Okay, you can now say, where are the no ops? Okay, I just add a label here just to find out where the no ops are. So, Control A, Control C, go back to the assembler, go back to the source tab. Paste again. So this time we have a new label definition. Where are the no ops? And then we go to the uh, symbol table tab again. 
Okay, so this time you can see that there's one extra thing, or if you prefer, you can always just you know, go to the pretty printer and then paste the new code in like so. And now you can see that there's one extra entry for where are the node ops. It is defined on line three, and then the RPN is a three. Unfortunately, this time they're also just coincidentally, they're all threes, but RPN is the one that you want to pay attention to, okay? It is the actual value of the label itself. <clears throat> now, some of you are probably you know, thinking, you know, uh, what does RPN stand for? Why do you want to use RPN instead of value of or value or something like that? That would be a great question to, to ask. RPN stands for reversed Polish notation, which is how we can use expressions instead of a constant. We can use RPN, you know, which is also known as postfix notation, to specify a value for an immediate or a certain value. Now, it's beyond the scope of this you know, class you know, today, but at some point, we're going to take a look at postfix expressions so that we can actually, instead of just saying 47 or 3 or something like that, we can use an expression that has multiplication, division, addition, subtraction, and so on. Because you know, there are occasions there where you want to use a calculation, you want to use an expression to calculate, how do I want to define the constant that I want to load into a register? So we'll get to that point. But right now, all you have to know is look up the RPN of a label that tells you how a label is defined. All right, so I think that's all you need to know for the lab today. And we are at a really kind of good place to pause the lecture right now and see if there are any questions you want me to answer. Oh, I know what I want to say. <clears throat> How do we study in this class at this point? Okay, I think that's a pretty good uh, topic to go over. Okay, there are several things. First of all, um, there is the opcode table. The opcode table is important in many ways because it specifies what opcodes are available in the processor, and it also tells you what each one does, okay? So you really want to go over the ones that we have already talked about or the ones that are related to the ones that we have talked about. So we have already talked about the ones that go through the ALU, so that would be the add, subtract, write shift, not, um, and then there's the and and the or, okay? So there are these two as well. So these are the ones that we have already kind of talked about. Um, it would be nice if you can just kind of write a very simple program, one single opcode, just to exercise, okay? Just to check out how the processor would make the connections between the registers and the ALU and then connect the output back into the register bank just so that you can get some exercise of understanding the architecture itself. Today, we talked about the ST instruction we also talked about the LDI instruction as well as the LD instruction. That is another family of instructions because all of these specifically talk to memory and it changes registers in a certain way. So the next ones you know, that we'll be talking about would be the jump instructions, you know, JMP, I, and you know, the other conditional branches, you know, branch instructions. So this is one thing, okay, this is important. The assembler manual is also useful, okay, you know, um, if it's not useful, I wouldn't have written it, right? So that means, you know, you might want to read it too because it describes the syntax of the reverse Polish notation. It describes, you know, how labels are defined and a few other things that might be useful, okay? So you might want to read this one too. <clears throat> so these are all useful, important documents to read. But the most important part is to go through the exercise that I just went through today to track down how instructions work in the processor edge by edge. Now, at the first part of this class, like right now, from your perspective, I wouldn't you know, skip and just go like, oh, three clicks to get over with the fetch you know, phase, one more click to get over with the decode, and now we can just get to the instruction. I would do it click by click and figure out how things are done for each edge transi transition. So once you get used to that, you know, like doing it like two or three times, you go like, oh, okay, I'm pretty sure I know what's going on with the rising edge, falling edge, and rising edge again, and then the falling edge. So 
then you can focus on just the implementation of the opcodes. Okay, but it is there's nothing that can replace you going through the process of tracking down what is happening when an instruction happens. Okay, now we have just talked about the LDI instruction and the LD instructions today in the lecture, but we haven't talked about the SP instruction. So one thing you can do is to exercise the ST instruction. Okay, um, I can give you a program to kind of test out. Okay, so we can what we do is we look at the program that we already already have here, and then what we're going to do is to change the program a little bit here. So what we do is we're going to say, okay, let's put a certain value into register B. So we in we basically just say, okay, let's make register B seventy three. And then, instead of using the LD instruction, we now do a ST instruction. So this is doing the reverse. Instead of reading what is at location at the L1 label, we are going to change whatever it had before to a 73. So this gives you your exercise, your opportunity to exercise this entire thing and focusing on what the ST instruction is going to do and how it gets the job done. The ST instruction is the reverse of the LD instruction. So in this case, it's going to take the value of register B and copy that to the location in RAM that register, register D is pointing to. So it's basically the exact opposite of the LD instruction. Okay, now that I have described what it is supposed to do, it is your turn to go into the processor, go into larger sim, and actually track down you know, all those multiplexers, all the demultiplexers, figure out which register is enabled, how RAM is you know, being used, and so on, to convince yourself that, okay, I understand the mechanism of how the ST instruction works. Okay? So that is an exercise that you have to do. Okay? You know, you, you know, it's just one of those things, you know, and that is how I would assume people would study for this class, at least at this point. Getting familiarized with the instructions, both in terms of what they do and how they get a job done is the key right now at this point of this class. Because once we get familiarized with the instructions, fully understanding what they do, how they get a job done, then we can talk about combinations of those instructions together and say, oh, this particular sequence is gonna get this done. That particular sequence is gonna get that done, okay? But right now, we just need to understand how each and every single instruction works. Then we can talk about the combination and how they work together. <clears throat> so are we doing okay so far? Okay. So is it going to be tedious? Yes. Okay. But that means you, know, you can have ways. You can try to have ways to make it simpler. One thing you can do is to go to um, File, go to Export Image. Or you can print directly, depending on what kind of printer you have. So you can go to print, <clears throat> and you print to a, so in my case, I can print to a PDF you know, device. So what I'm doing is I'm just printing the circuit to a PDF file. So once you have that PDF file, you can either use you know, certain tools on the PC, you know, on your computer to mark it up, to highlight you know, all the things that you should look at first, all the registers, the RAM component, and stuff like that. There are only a few things that you should start with. Okay, even though the processor looks really busy, most of those things are just switches. They are not really of great importance. You only have registers and the RAM that are things that can update. So you only have to start with those, and there are only very few of those things that you have to pay attention to. So once you print it out, you can print out multiple copies, one for each instruction that you're going through highlight you know, the actual connection between the components because that will help you visualize, oh, when this instruction happens, we have this path connecting from here to here and that path going from here to here, this register is going to update. And you can add your own annotation on the PDF, right? It doesn't cost you anything other than, you know, I guess, you know, thousands of bytes you know, on your hard drive. But it's going to be a very useful exercise. 
So that's my recommendation, you know, of how to, you know, study, quote unquote, study this class, you know, at this point, because all of this stuff is going to be helpful when you get onto the upper division version of this class at a four year university. How do I know that? Because I have students who email back to me after they have transferred to Berkeley, to UC Davis, and they tell me that the content of this class, the one that you're in right now, really helped to prepare those students to take the upper division version of the same class. Alrighty, so I don't think I have anything to add, so I can basically just let you guys get started with the lab today. <clears throat> So the lab today, let me go to the lab and make it visible and then give you guys the access code. So the lab today is um, LDI, LD, and ST. So, or LD, ST, and LDI. <clears throat> so let me make it visible first. Come on, make it visible. So it should be visible to you now. And then the uh, access code is just LDI itself all lowercase. <clears throat> this one may take some time, okay? So for those of you who typically can get the lab done in like 15 minutes, this is one of the, this is not one of those. This one will take a little bit longer because one of the questions is going through the entire processor and ask you, what do you think this tunnel is gonna do? What is this tunnel doing here? What, what is it specifying over here? So that one will take a little bit of time, but it is just one way to get you to get familiarized with the processor. <clears throat> All right. So while you guys are doing this, I will go back to my office and get the uh, exams. So for those of you who want to get your exam back, you'll have it available. And I'll get back to you in a few minutes. Probably can turn off the recorder now. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, so right here. 